Okay. You're welcome. Okay, so let's officially sort of get things started here. Um, you have entered best practices for delivering a course online. Um, so I think everybody is in the right spot. I've been sort of taking attendance as we've been going along. Uh, my name is Tracy Miller and I'm the online teaching coordinator at Northern Illinois Faculty Development Instructional Design Center. And I'm actually um, happy to welcome someone from outside the university. We've opened these workshops to the public. Um, so hopefully some of these practices can really help you um, and look for these supports and these other ideas that we're going to share in your organization. Uh, my objectives for this afternoon is um, to help you discover some practical strategies about how to communicate with your students, how to grade your student work, and how to support your online students. So hopefully everyone has similar goals. Uh, Z, I see that you have come in and out of the session, so I'm hoping that you have a good connection. Uh, one of the strategies you can try is to um, log on from a different browser. Sometimes um, Firefox is the one that typically works the best, but Chrome can also work well. But I certainly hope you could join us today. So as an introduction to the workshop, uh, there's a lot that goes into um, a quality online experience. And this pie sort of represents all these, those elements that are important um, to a successful online environment. Um, many of our workshops, if you've attended them in the past, we really talk a lot about course design um, and, you know, you can kind of see all the different elements that would go into it um, right down to how ready you are to teach online and how ready the students are to kind of uh, be successful in that environment. Today's particular workshop, we're going to be focusing on course delivery. So really the, um, the, the teaching that goes into it. Arlene, thank you so much for your question. What does LMS mean? That is our learning management system, which at NIU is Blackboard. Um, so I, I appreciate the question. Sometimes um, I can forget that th these acronyms don't mean as much to everyone else. So thank you for your question. Um, I'll also mention at this point that I often repeat your questions in the text chat area or your comments. And that's just so um, you can kind of refresh yourself watching the recording or somebody that um, hasn't experienced um, this sort of synchronous environment this afternoon um, can understand what's going on in the text chat area um, because that's not represented in the recording. Okay, so what I'm gonna suggest, um, some of the things we talked about um, as my objectives were that, you know, you're gonna need to communicate with your students um, you're going to need to grade student work and you're going to need to support their learning in a face to face environment and in a online course. So um, what's going to be so different about an online environment? And I think the big difference is going to be the approach that you take. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about a lot in this course, that a lot of these best practices are not going to be um, different fundamentally uh, from a face-to-face -face course. It just may be a little different on how you uh, kind of implement it in an online course. So the first thing that you would do in any sort of course, whether it's face-to-face -face or online, is you're going to want to get to know your students. And I think especially in an online environment, um, we think that maybe that's not possible. Uh, that's what I hear a lot from um, instructors and faculty that I talk to, that we, we really can't get to know each other, um, you know, but it happens very naturally in a face-to-face -face course um, because we're seeing each other and there's certain indicators 
um, that kind of um, shows our personality when we're meeting each other face to face. In an online course, um, you need to be a little bit more intentional about it, um, more purposeful about how you're going to get to know each other. And here's just a few things um, that kind of helped me wrap my head around it. Um, and it's this idea of um, why is it important to get to know each other? It's important to know what the student's motivation is to kind of be in this course. And then how can you, as the leader of the course, um, help students get to know you, how you can get to know them, and also how they can get to know each other. So um, I did find this chart and I've, I've adapted it here um, from Ambrose. Um, how Learning Starts Seven Research-Based Principles for Smart Teaching. And one of the things is students have a lot of their own self-interest. Um, why did they choose this course? Um, why did they choose higher education? Um, you know, what, it, what else is going on in their lives? And so what I'm suggesting that as the instructor, you should connect the material somehow to the student's interest um, if you can. So more, the more you get to know about them, the more you'll be able to facilitate those connections between the material that you're presenting, you're delivering in your online course, and um, how that might appeal to their own self-interest. Um, one of the ways you could do that is um, to begin that dialogue that you're going to have with them and share something personal but not intimate about yourself. Um, so it doesn't have to be all business all the time. Um, anything that you can kind of, um, that you're comfortable with sharing with your students, um, there might be some kind of connection um, that you have, and then you're gonna build that trust in that relationship. And when you're connecting with content, um, you know, they're gonna feel your presence a little bit more. Uh, we are going to go through some best practices in online teaching today um, quickly, and there's a, a lot sort of to cover. So I don't go into anything in too, too much detail, but one of the sessions that we have just done this semester is called Humanizing Your Online Course. And so when we talk about sharing something personal and expressing interest in um, your students, uh, a lot of that has, has to do with that humanizing your course. Um, how can you put your personality in your presence in the course? Um, it's a really important best practice um, for an online course because it can feel so absent and isolating if, if you're not intentional about it. Um, so let's move down to students' academic life. That's another thing that they're very motivated about. Um, you know, they, they may have their own goals uh, for the course. They may have um, personal aspirations. They might have that particular grade in mind. Um, I know one of my students this semester um, right up front told me that um, she was an overachiever and she was getting an A in this class and um, she wasn't sure if she was going to be challenged or not. And so I definitely had conversations with her over the course. Um, of the semester asking her, are you challenged yet? And uh, you know what, she got her A, but she did not get her 100%. Um, her so um, I like to think that I challenged her a little bit. Um, uh, one of the ways that you can really show re relevance um, and why this is important to their academic life is to let them know what your expectations are and also to identify and reward what you value. Um, it's, you know, um, whether that's um, proper writing citations or honesty or challenging thoughts, different things that you think are of value in this course. Um, let your students know um, when they are sort of um, meeting your expectations and demonstrating these attributes and, and how it relates to their academic life. Um, of course, they're very concerned about how this is going to relate to their future professional life. Um, higher ed is, is much more now than um, just experiencing education. 
um, it's really tied closely to um, career success. And so any way you can show your students um, how your content um, is going to lead into their um, professional life is important. Some ways you can do that, how you can take the lead, um, is to show a passion or enthusiasm for your discipline. Um, again, hard maybe to do in an online course to show that, um, that pa passion and enthusiasm. So you may need to think about how you're going to do that. Um, but the best practice is to absolutely um, try to do that, whether it's pictures, whether um, it's links to um, a professional presentation that you're doing, just saying, you know, that I continue um, to learn in my discipline. Um, any way you can connect to common skills. Um, so maybe it's not a course that's part of their program or um, they're not seeing the direct relationship to this content, to the, uh, their future career. Um, connect them in some ways and let them know exactly how this is going to be benefit them later in life. And then finally, acknowledge any current professional lives. Um, online courses are often taken by um, working um, adults, professionals. Um, so you kind of want to just say, you know, I understand what you're going through um, and uh, even maybe allow them to um, take something they're doing in their, their current professional lives and incorporate it into maybe an assignment that you are providing for them. So all of these things are why it's important that they get to know each other and uh, different ways that you can kind of take the lead on making it happen in your course. But here's some really practical ways that you can do this. And this is a, a great way, I think, to um, maybe put a little bit of your personality into the course, but also to allow your, um, your students to put a little personality into the course. And um, let them have these use our Blackboard profiles. And the profile tour, uh, tool is something that you will find um, when you're on Blackboard. Um, at the top of the page um, next to your name and um, these little red icons that you may see up there. Um, if you haven't filled out your Blackboard profile already, uh, you'll probably see a little silhouette up there. And if you go ahead and click on that silhouette, um, you can add, you can see here's what a profile looks like. You can add a picture. Um, you can add a, a little um, biography, but these tiles are also pretty interesting to add into uh, your profile. Um, they are student-centered, so you can encourage your students to fill out these uh, profiles too. Um, but I think they're a little bit adaptable to um, how we can add a little bit about ourselves. Uh, what I do is I ask, actually ask my students to do a a profile and I give them 10 points for it um, early on. Um, after they do this, all of the discussion boards will have their profile picture in it. And if you hover over it, um, you can get some brief information. I love knowing what my uh, students major is. Uh, the course I teach um, is more gen ed. And so I, I get quite a diverse group. And so I think it's, it's kind of fun when we, we can kind of all come together. Um, I also tell them that they do not have to use a profile picture of themselves. Um, maybe they're adding a picture of their dog or um, their, their favorite vacation spot or something like that. And even that tells me a little bit about my students. Um, next thing um, in this vein of sort of communicating with your students, communicate with your students Frequently, This is another best practice. Um, and here's just a couple ways that you can communicate with them frequently. Uh, the first one is to use um, reminders um, in your announcement area. Use announcements. Uh, you can kind of plan out your announcements. Um, and I'm saying frequently, so at least once a week. You know, we're going into the summer term, and if anyone out there is teaching this summer, you're probably teaching an eight-week or even a four-week course. 
So that means your announcements are going to need to be more frequent so that your students are, are engaging in the content on a very frequent basis. And they also are feeling, again, that, that communication with that, that connection with the course. Um, but you can also use a announcement as a reminder. Um, something that's coming up, um, maybe it's um, a part of a paper, um, maybe it's just a reminder of a quiz coming up. Um, this is something that we, I really feel like we would do in a face-to-face -face course um, very naturally, where if we were having a, um, a Monday session, we would write, remind them that on Wednesday a quiz is coming up. Um, so this is not about um, sort of, you know, over catering to the students. I think that this is a, a communication method um, that we're comfortable with in face-to-face, -face, and we're just going to kind of use our technology on, in, in the online courses. Um, so set up reminders. But today, I would like to talk a little bit about some new features. Um, this weekend is the Blackboard upgrade, and so the system will be down for um, several hours. Um, early, early Saturday morning, um, kind of through Saturday. Um, they usually allow for, you know, quite a big window, but then um, it usually takes less time than they predict. So um, give yourself a break on Saturday. Um, but one of our new upgrade features is this ability to send a reminder from the Great Center. So this little um, screenshot that I've created here is just a, a small snapshot of what might, it might look like in your grade center. And you can see the needs grading icon that you probably are familiar with if you've already been using Blackboard to teach. Um, but you also see that a couple students have not submitted their work yet. Let's say you're um, it's uh, within the last 12 hours of when an assignment is due, and you just want to send a reminder out to your students, but specifically to the students that have not submitted anything yet. And so that's what this new Send Reminder tool does. Um, it will be accessible by clicking on the drop down menu right next to the column title in your grade center. And then you'll see um, just a couple spots down is the send reminder. And it'll give you a message um, that it's going to email six students um, who have not, do not have a grade or submission yet. And then you'll just click on the OK. Um, it is a, um, a canned message. It's not customizable. Um, but again, it's just going to send those students a quick reminder. Um, and I am very anxious to see how it's going to work after the upgrade um, this weekend. Uh, here's another best practice. Um, and this is something that folks ask me all the time. What is the best practice um, for responding to your students? And I'm just going to throw it out there and say 24 to 48 hours. Um, that's what I see um, most frequently, and it gets back to that kind of frequency mode. Um, I think, again, though, if you're having a summer course, especially one of those four-week courses, um, you might need to accelerate your response rate just because things are happening so quickly. However, the real best practice is that you let your students know what your response um, kind of rate is going to be. Um, so in this case, in my instructor page, I've added this um, communication expectations area. And so I've let the students know that not only do I prefer that they ask their questions first in the question and answer forum, but that they can um, expect a response from me within 24 to 48 hours. Um, and then I also encourage them that if it's anything um, that's a little bit more personal, that they can certainly email me. And in that case, I will respond within 24 hours. Um, it, it's a couple different things that make this the best practice. 
Um, one is that the students, um, it might reduce their stress that they're going to hear from you quickly, but it's also going to alleviate the burden for you um, to have to have sort of this instantaneous um, response time. Um, you know, the, the students that um, may expect some kind of response rate in the middle of the night or something like that. You're letting them know um, that um, they will get a prompt response from you, um, but it's not necessarily going to be immediate. Um, again, these are my rules. You can make up your own. The important part is that um, you let your students know what they are. Here's another idea um, to, um, again, communicate with your students in a way that um, might have a little bit more of your personality in it, and again, put sort of a face, a humanizing your course a little bit, is to use media. Um, in this screenshot here that I've created, um, I just use my webcam and I'm just kind of um, talking to the students about how they can introduce themselves and where they can introduce themselves. It's my welcome to the course. Um, and so you can use media uh, really throughout the course. Um, anywhere you see the text chat, uh, the text editor, um, whether you're adding an item or um, adding, you know, something um, in a different content area, you can embed it with a video. In this case, um, I, I usually take all my videos, I download them and I add them to YouTube so that I can close caption them, which is why in this example, I left the closed captioning on so you can see um, sort of what I was saying and, and how I'm using that, that closed captioning, which is what I do in my course. So another idea for using um, communicating with your students is to use the retention center. Um, if you're familiar with the retention center, actually, let me do a check in. Who is already using the retention center? Let me know by um, just putting a yes or a smiley face in the, to the text chat area. Corinne is not. Okay, well, um, let me briefly, oh, lots of no's. Okay, so now I'll have to tell you what it's all about. So the retention area is um, found under the evaluation area in the course management area. And so if you open up um, that evaluation, you'll see the retention center is the second one down. It is um, actually keeping track of some at-risk behaviors for your students. And they're in some different categories, um, missed deadlines, grades alert, activity alert, and access alert. Um, and so anytime your students trigger one of these alerts, then um, they show up in the at-risk uh, table, it's called, when you open up the retention center. So, you know, a couple different things you need to look at. One of them is um, you have to you have to add due dates in order for them to miss deadlines. Um, a grades alert is set at 25% um, below the course average. You can change any of these um, criteria. Um, for instance, if I wanted to change uh, the deadline to two deadlines are missed before it triggers alert, I can do that by um, customizing my retention center. Um, the activity alert is basically a collection of things that the students are um, doing in the course, um, but it definitely is looking for um, this reduction in activity that they really should be engaging a little bit more in using Blackboard. And then the final one is an access alert. When's the last time the students um, access the course? So that's another, um, use your tools is another best practice and the retention center is already working for you. You just may not know it. Um, in an online course, if the students are not accessing the course on a regular basis, 
um, that is definitely something to pay attention to. Um, my example here, because um, we're still sort of talking about communication, is to use your retention center to notify your students um, that they are exhibiting at-risk behaviors. And so you can do that by going up to the top and selecting uh, this notify button. It'll create a drop down menu and it, you can notify uh, just the individual. Um, another option I like is you can notify a uh, course observer. So if the student um, already has um, an, been demonstrating kind of um, across the university and has an observer with them, then you can also notify the observer through this activity. Um, there is um, is kind of a canned message in there um, where it just the sub subject lines that they're exhibiting at risk behaviors um, and, and identifying it, um, but you can personalize that message, uh, which is something that I absolutely do here. Um, in this case, um, Leonardo is exhibiting um, several at risk behaviors. And so um, I want to call his attention to that and um, maybe suggest that uh, we have a face to face meeting or um, have some kind of strategies that we go over um, in order to improve these behaviors. Um, and here at the bottom, it creates this notification history. And so that's why I like to use the, the retention center instead of maybe just sending an email um, because it always reminds me of when that um, notification was sent out and maybe when I want to tap it back in with the student if I haven't heard from them. Um, I might want to accelerate um, my, my methods at this point a little bit. Um, the other thing I can do in the retention center is I can click the monitor button. And so um, if, if my at-risk table has several students in it, but I'm most concerned about um, Leo here, then I will um, maybe select that monitor. And that um, just allows me to realize that, um, you know, especially maybe in a large class, that um, he's one that I'm definitely paying attention to. Okay, so, um, I, I was talking briefly about how the retention center um, is tracking your grading, but we're going to switch gears a little bit to talk about grading. I was going to pause in between and ask for questions, and I see Zoe has one. Do you view this by individual student, um, or does BB provide some sort of alert? Um, the, the alert it, it, um, kind of takes the form of that at risk table. Um, so take a look at that when you get a chance. Um, maybe a, a course that you taught in spring and you didn't even realize that this at risk table was being um, created, but it doesn't really create an alert like we would think of where um, you're, you're going to get some kind of notification. Um, about a year ago, I would say, uh, Division of IT um, did consider, had these emails created that would alert the, um, the instructor that um, these things were being populated. Um, but I think until we get a little bit more momentum, um, it might sort of just look um, alarming. Um, it, I guess it should. But if you start getting all these emails and you don't really quite even know what the retention center is yet, um, we just kind of back off of that a little bit. Um, we do track um, who uses all of the different tools. Um, so I think at, at a certain level, if we see that there's a lot of activity in the retention center, you know, we would we would start kind of a campaign um, and maybe uh, create those alerts. Um, but I'm glad you were interested in them because uh, we were very close. Um, I think we actually brought it in, in front of the, the faculty senate and they, it it made them a little nervous. So uh, the more this tool is being promoted and used, um, hopefully we can we can move to that system. Um, that's going to alert us to check out the retention center. Um, so the next, the first thing I want to talk about with grading is one of the best practices is really 
um, keeping your students on track, and in parentheses I said, and yourself on track. Um, you know, you, you want to commit to yourself and to your students that they will have um, frequent feedback and allow them to know um, what they're achieving in the course and, and maybe what some improvements they can make. So some of the ways, uh, some of those best practices, again, for keeping your students on track um, is to let them know what your feedback strategy is and um, your grading timetable, and then really commit to that. Similar to your response rate, let them know what it is um, and then make sure you, you kind of stick to it. So in this case, I'm letting students know um, that they can expect their grades and feedback to be posted within three days of the assignment's due date. Um, and I'm also, because I have a um, Sunday night due date for the most part, um, that they, they should be looking for their grades on Wednesday. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about how you can keep yourself on track a little bit. But again, this is going to alleviate, hopefully, those, um, those emails and those concerns with, you know, when, it, when is things going to be graded? Um, because the students know that they're going to see it before Wednesday. Um, if you cannot commit to that on a certain week, um, let your students know. Um, let them know early. So if you know that you are going to be sort of out of pocket for a week, maybe you're going to a conference, um, let them know as soon as possible. If you know it's going to um, be some serious grading, there's a major um, paper that is coming due and you know you don't want to rush through it you want to take your time um, then again let the students know that that's what's going on um, i had a um, a sort of major project come up at the end of the semester um, and what i did was i let my students know that i would be grading their work first and then i would be getting to their reflection journals um, just because I knew their reflection journals, especially sort of at the end of the semester, um, they were going to be more concerned about um, their that that grade on that major paper, and not as concerned about me sending them well wishes um, in the reflection journal at the end of the semester. Um, so, how you sort of pace yourself and how you keep yourself on track. Pull your calendar out and look at what else you might have going on that semester. Um, so again, if you do need more time um, for grading or you know that there's going to be this difficult week, space out your assessments and um, think about how that's going to affect um, your kind of grading process. Um, also think about how your workflow really works. Um, if you have the option of picking out your, um, your own due dates, um, think about how that's going to work for you. So, like I said, my due dates are typically on a Sunday night. I like to grade on Mondays and Tuesdays. Um, others may rather have a due date that's on a Friday because they really like to dig into their grading over the weekend. So again, that's why I just recommend that you keep those, uh, bring, pull those calendars out um, and think about how you work best and then kind of come up with those due dates. Um, due dates can feel really different in a, um, an online course because um, it can be very asynchronous. Um, Ismail, we had a conversation yesterday um, when we were talking about um, pacing yourself and, and coming up with due dates and um, you know you don't necessarily have to make a due date like you would in a face-to-face -face course where um, something is due on the Tuesday uh, class time and another thing is due on Thursday class time. Um, it normally considered much more um, kind of a uh, work at your own pace during uh, the course of one week. Um, so just think about that. The best practice is to uh, not overburden you or your students with sort of 
all the stuff all at once. Um, okay, so I've got some other features to share with you um, so in, that will be happening in the upgrade uh, this weekend as it relates to grading, some new benefits that you're going to find. Um, and um, I am really excited about these. These um, new benefits make so much sense um, to me, and I think it's going to reduce um, some of the questions that we get. Uh, the first one is, if you've ever done an assignment where you've allowed students to um, have multiple attempts, whether it's a multiple attempt quiz or um, an assignment that maybe is going to be more of a draft and then a final, um, you've allowed the students to have multiple attempts, but you really maybe only are grading the last attempt. So what this new feature is going to do is um, it's going to allow you to re um, reduce all of those attempts that you don't care about grading. Um, many of you, if you haven't done multiple attempts or run into this, um, you might be thinking, well, I'm not sure I see the benefit. But what happens is your needs benefit just becomes full of all these attempts. Um, let's say um, for every one attempt that you're going to grade, you know, there's three needs of tense gradings. So you have to go through there and sort of um, manually um, just ignore them and get rid of all those needs grading. So this new feature um, will allow you to do that. So um, basically the default is it won't show the ones that um, don't need grading. But you do have this option if you wanted to show the attempts that that don't contribute to the grade. So um, that maybe that draft assignment. Um, so I'm looking forward to that uh, because I we do get that question here. How do I get rid of all those needs assignments? And it's going to be so much easier now um, with this new feature. Uh, the next one is that students will get an assignment submission receipt. So this is sort of the um, another Blackboard's answer to um, the dog ate my homework. So when they submit an assignment, when you're using um, the assignment tool, the students will get this message, um, success, your submission appears on this page. The submission confirmation number is. Copy and save this number for proof of your submission. So you can encourage your students to do that. Um, and then, you know, if that is, it, if it does seem like it's um, somehow missing, the students will have that confirmation um, in order uh, for it to be sort of tracked down by the Division of IT Service Desk. Um, this is the start of what they're doing. Um, what we're hearing is, um, in even newer upgrades, um, the students will actually receive an email with that confirmation number. Um, so they don't have to do the, sort of the copy and paste. But I think this is a great first start. Um, encourage your students to um, copy and paste, especially if, it, if it's kind of a, a high stakes assessment. Um, but again, I think this is, is, is going to be a really great tool um, that's going to help us sort of um, manage our online course. Um, best practice, definitely, to grade using Blackboard's interactive rubrics. Um, they take a bit of time to set up, but then you can use them over and over again, and they really make grading easier. So there's so many important parts to why um, these rubrics are best practice. One is they're letting your students know of your expectations that we talked about um, way back at the beginning of the webinar. Um, love interactive rubrics, I know. And you know what? Um, I say they take a lot of work. Um, they take a bit of planning because you want a really great rubric. Um, but um, really, they don't take that long to set up. They just take longer than nothing, right? Um, but then not only do they let your students know what your expectations are, but when you're going through that, um, that grading workflow, you pop open the interactive rubric on an assignment. Um, and 
the default is it won't show the descriptors or show the feedback that you'll see at the top here. Um, and that's really simple if you're really familiar with your, your grading rubric. Um, you kind of don't need to see all that. Um, but if you want to remind yourself what you added to the rubric, go ahead, turn on those um, descriptors. Um, and you're just clicking buttons and Blackboard's adding those scores up for you. Um, the feedback tool is a great one. Um, if you just want to add some quick feedback that's very particular to um, a certain part of a student assignment, uh, the example I have here is substantive. So I'm um, letting students know that I expect at least 250 words in their initial post in a, dis um, a discussion board. Um, if they've done that, that's great. I can just do a, a quick um, click on a button. It's reinforcing my expectation. It is giving them a, a type of feedback. Um, but if they were below expectations, um, for instance, I might want to give them some more specific feedback. And so I could add it in here to the um, feedback area. Um, this post was less than 200 or less than, let's say, 200 words, and um, you really need to give me more detail on it. So it's letting them, the students know specifically why I chose this grade for them. Um, so how many best practices are rolled into this one? Um, lets the students know the expectations, lets you grade and give them feedback quickly, um, and will hopefully reduce the amount of questions that you receive on why um, a student got a particular grade. Um, a really great feature, yes. It, it, it has so many great things that it is definitely um, worth the time. You can also find a lot of great um, rubrics, especially on those ones that are maybe more online centric um, by just kind of, you know, Googling it uh, online and, and kind of finding the one, the phrase that really works the best for you. Um, so my best next practice is to save common feedback phrases. Um, and I like to create this table of feedback phrases. And I break them into a couple different categories, um, positive and constructive. Um, and I think both are important. We can, um, and sometimes we can be a little short on our positive ones um, because we are sort of more focusing on the folks maybe that need some help. Um, but I think in both cases, the importance um, of really quality feedback phrases. Um, what makes a best practice um, feedback phrase is that um, they are specific to the student and that they um, may be even measurable in some way. What is so great about this work? Um, and, and why is it, why are they showing improvement? Why are you so proud of your students for this, this particular work? Um, in the constructive range, that's definitely where you want to be looking for something that's measurable, something that the next time you look at the student's work, um, you can tell that they've made the improvement that you suggested on it. Um, and then you can kind of mix and match up these phrases um, that maybe um, are more personalized, um, but at least you, you've got some kind of base that goes along with it. Um, in my constructive example here, please remember to use proper APA citations. This is important improvement. This important improvement will increase your point value and academic integrity. Um, so this is one that you can use, um, you know, um, frequently with, with many, many students. Um, this next one here, could you expand on this idea of reconstruction, including sample? Um, this could be a phrase that added right into the inline grading in, in Blackboard. And so you're kind of adding comment right where they're talking about um, reconstruction. Um, but again, I said you can kind of mix these up. So would you rather say um, you should be more concise on this idea of con uh, reconstruction? You know, So that's what I mean by you can kind of really um, take some of these phrases and um, quickly be able to give your students um, 
some really good feedback. I'm going to switch gears again, and we're going to talk a little bit more about how you can support your students and their success, which is so important here um, at Northern. Um, one of the things you can do is conduct a pre-survey. Um, you can use the Blackboard survey tool. Um, here at NIU, we also use Qualtrics. We all have access to Qualtrics. Um, ask your students what their goals are for the course. This is almost gets back to that getting to know them. Um, what do they want out of their course? Maybe it's some prerequisite knowledge uh, that you'd like to kind of tap into. Um, I was talking to a faculty member yesterday. Um, they're going to do um, a poll on um, when the students want to um, have office hours um, in an online course that's happening this summer. So um, definitely some way that you can, again, use the technology you have available um, and help support the students the best way possible. Um, we were just talking about office hours. Um, you can host a virtual office hour. Um, and you can use Blackboard Collaborate, um, the tool that we're actually using for this online workshop this afternoon. Um, you can also use um, Outlook Skype, Skype for Business we have here. You can use Google Hangouts, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, still give your online students that benefit um, of your, your receptive ears um, and have a virtual office hour. Um, it could be something that happens consistently or something that maybe you're going to require the students to set an appointment for. Um, again, just let them know um, when it is, and that can really help them um, feel supported. Um, provide this, your students with a frequently asked questions area or a question and answer um, discussion forum. Um, Nicole says, are those features available for regular courses too? Um, yes, they are. Absolutely. Um, Nicole, I, um, I'm, I have this big smile on my face, and that's because of many of the things that we talk about um, for online courses, um, at some point somebody says, can I do that in my face-to-face -face course too? And um, you absolutely can. Um, you can just use um, your Blackboard course. Um, actually, you can use Blackboard um, Collaborate in, um, in any Blackboard course that's there automatically. Um, we actually use a portal that we've created through a Blackboard community um, for our online workshops. So that's another option. Um, but definitely Skype for Business is available for anybody at NIU and, and Google Hangouts too. So, good question. Um, so, I'll, I'll give your students a place to um, be able to ask questions um, that maybe have to do with the navigation of the course. Um, or um, sometimes they'll, they'll give you really good information, like a, a link is broken or something. So, it's just a matter of giving them um, a place to ask those questions. Um, so, I'll tie that a little bit back to what, uh, what might happen in a face to face course. You might ask, you know, does anybody have any questions on last night's homework? Or um, was everybody, you know, um, able to? you know, find the reading that I assigned to you. And, and so we do that again in a face-to-face -face course. We just need to make a place for it um, in an online course. And so a question that answer discussion is a really good tool. Uh, the frequently asked question is definitely something that if you find that a uh, question comes up um, semester after semester, you can kind of anticipate that and, and add a FAQ question to your course. Um, this is an activity that um, I used to do face-to-face, um, -face, and I um, think it's important, or it's an idea, it's a strategy maybe to add into an online course, and it's called the muddiest point. So um, that could be um, even a reflection journal that you do with your students, and you tell them, you know, each week, let me know sort of what you're struggling with the most or what um, concept isn't quite sinking in. Um, it, and again, it's just giving them that place um, and calling it muddiest point. Um, 
it, it, it's such a, you know, messy picture. It's hard to understand, but it, it gives them a clear place to ask and, and kind of struggle with their questions a little bit, um, struggle with that concept in a really safe environment that they feel like they can go to. Um, some ways you can support your students learning is to remember NIU's support units and refer your students to them. Uh, we do have a lot of good support units here. Um, I do an entire um, online workshop on the many different um, support units we have here and how to find them. Um, take some time to, um, to look for them and to find them. And if there's something that um, you're uncomfortable with, let your students know um, the right place that they can find that support. So just, I guess, just don't forget that they're there for you. Um, and you can concentrate on delivering the content and your students are still supported in, in so many other ways um, so that they can kind of, again, tap into their, their learning. Um, some best practices um, that I think maybe just um, didn't fit into a category uh, quite as neatly as the other ones. Um, use your student preview mode. Um, Ismail, I, ho I hope you'll give me a shout out on how excited we were when we talked yesterday about using student preview mode. Um, it lets you view, it gives you that student view, but you can also try submitting work and, and grading your own work. And so um, if you're unsure about how something's going to look from the student side of things um, or how things are going to look when students actually, um, you know, provide you with some work or take a test, um, remember to use the student preview mode. It's at the top of your um, Blackboard screen and it looks sort of, to me it looks like an eyeball um, or maybe kind of, um, kind of a swir swirl around a duct. Um, my next best practice is to reverse order um, you had no idea about it. I know it's, it's a great tool. Um, reverse order your structure. So when you're creating um, that structure in your online course, you can start with um, module one, unit one, week one, whatever you want to call it at the bottom and build your um, units on top of that and um, make the later units unavailable to the students. Um, so they won't see all of that in, until the proper time, um, but also whatever the most current work is then appears sort of on the top. So reverse order your structure. Um, do set availability, availability date restrictions um, whenever that's appropriate. Um, that can help um, you be a little bit more timely. Um, it's going to... Um, allow you to kind of work ahead a little bit, but not uh, necessarily let the students see everything that's going on yet. Um, and to add due dates. Um, that retention center will not work as well without due dates. Due dates also go into the course calendar, so it's helping your students manage their time. Um, if you are using discussion boards that are uh, content um, specific, make sure that you enable grading. That can be something that you forget to do, um, especially if you're more used to using uh, discussions for um, a getting to know you activity or question and answer discussion we talked about. Enable grading makes your grading workflow much easier. Um, and again, it's gonna, it's gonna create that grade center column and everything else that, that works really well um, when you're using discussion forms. Um, and my final best practice is to model the behaviors you want. Um, so whether that's the tone, is it professional, welcoming, friendly, um, are, are you particular about um, citations? Um, do you like to use um, pictures or links? Um, or do you expect that from your student? Then you're going to want to model those behaviors. Okay, so we are in the last two minutes of our webinar and I'll certainly stick around um, for questions. But in summary, um, communicate with your students often. Uh, grade 
student work, but remember to use your tools. Um, support your online students. They can feel very isolated, um, you know, because they're um, not necessarily here on campus. Remember to use your resources. Um, manage your own workload. Remember to take care of yourself. I always, whenever I see that, I think about how you always put um, the oxygen mask on yourself when you're <laughs> in a plane situation before you put it on um, the person next to you. And that's so that you can be at your very best in order to, to support your students. Um, contact us. Um, again, my name is Tracy Miller and I'm the online teaching coordinator. Here is my email. Um, we are here all summer. Um, we are excited to be working with folks, either the folks that are um, starting an online course this summer or preparing to an online course for the fall. Um, just again, just reach out to me. I'd love to have a conversation. We can talk more about your course. Um, I'm going to stop.